Hello and welcome to the Shiny New Object podcast. My name is Tom Ollerton. This is a podcast about marketing technology. Each week or so, I interview one of the most interesting thinkers from the marketing and advertising industry about their favorite new bit of marketing technology or their shiny new object. I asked them to go into a bit of detail about how it works, what it is, but also what are the practical applications for brands and agencies to help you make sense of whether you should take on that technology or not. This week, I interviewed Simon Kemp, who is the founder and CEO of Kepios, a consultancy based out of Singapore. And they, in their words, say that they help brands make sense of the future and they also do a very good job of making sense of the present Uh, you will probably know Simon's work from the last few years every year he produces a report called the digital in 2018 global overview which I think at the last count the last deck was around 5,000 slides long and it looks at internet mobile social digital penetration across the planet from hundreds if not thousands of different data points it's a a literally fascinating and unique document um but i don't need to tell you how good it is because simon does a very good job of that and then once we talked about that we will get on to simon's shiny new object which is artificial intelligence and empathy Uh, i made the mistake of going head to head with him and really sort of trying to take him on on an intellectual level which didn't go well um which you can here at the end of the episode but Simon's a lovely guy uh, super smart and has a lot of good things to talk about so let's let him crack on so hi Simon hey Tom i just seen you live live and direct on the interwebs yeah so you were doing a live talk about your global digital report correct 2018 2018 on yeah. stage at we are social. Yes. And I think it was quite a remarkable performance because you, there's been more snow in London in the last 24 <laughs> hours than there has been in the last three decades. Yes. Uh, but yeah, you still got 100 people to come yeah, down and watch it. That is incredible. How the was it? It was good. The fact that people turned up that early in the morning in the snow to listen to me talk about data for an hour, I'm still just I'm blown away. I don't understand. People's priorities are a little bit peculiar. But hey, it was great. So we had lots of people, uh, lots of questions. So we did about 20 minutes of numbers and then we went into the trends for 2018. So what the things marketers need to know. So tell me about the report. I've been, obviously, I've read every page of every one for the last three or four years, but assume people listening to this podcast have absolutely no idea what it is. Can you give us a kind of succinct roundup of the report? Sure. So it started seven years ago. Uh, It was a way of me basically being a little bit lazy. I used to get a lot of emails from people saying, can you tell me how many people use Facebook in Vietnam and stuff like that? And I thought, sure. But after you've answered the 15th email about how many people use Facebook in Vietnam, I thought there's got to be an easier way of doing this. So I started collating those numbers into a report, which we published on SlideShare. Uh, The first report we did was 16 pages long, and that was back in 2011. And we've now got to the 2018 report, 5,000 charts. 5,000. And all done manually. So, right. Yeah. And, um, so Sarah, who is sitting with us at the moment, but hiding behind the camera. Um, so Sarah and I basically put together 5,000 charts of PowerPoint numbers. Um, Tom's face at this point, <laughs> listeners, is uh, quite a picture. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tom loves PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so what happened with that first report? So presumably for 16 slides, how many, how many views did you get of that? So that one, I, th- I seem to remember we had a... About 20,000 views within a few months of that. So it was really quite impressive straight away in terms of the the traction that it got. And a lot of that was people like journalists. So, you know, I'd put it out there as a little bit of a way of saving myself answering inbound inquiries to the business. This is when I set up We Are Social in Singapore. Um, But we had a lot of journalists around the region saying, this is really interesting. Do you have any numbers on the following? And I was like, oh, yeah, I could get that data. So it, it grew organically really quickly. So there were people saying, where will I find the following bits of information. I was like, oh, I can get that for you. I'll just create a slide. And give me a sense of where it is now in terms of reach. So you've got, what, 5,000 slides? And what, yeah, so what are we talking about in terms of We numbers? break it down into a few different reports now. So we cover 239 countries around the world, um, countries and territories, probably, because you'll then get listeners saying, there aren't that many countries, which is probably true. Uh, 239 territories, um, we've got a quite considerable volume of data for each of those. So we have to break it up into individual reports. But across, I think we had about 40 reports this year. 
Um, but last year's numbers for the full year, when you look at people reading previous year's reports as well as that current year's report, we get 5 million people reading the report every year. And who are they? Who's reading it? So it's really interesting because SlideShare give you insights. So if you've ever uploaded something to SlideShare, if you go into your analytics um, section, then it tells you where individual viewers have come from based on their IP address. So a lot of that is just based on what mobile network they're on. So that's not massively insightful. It tells you what country they're from. But if they're accessing from a company that has an IP address that is easily identified, then it will tell you. So I know that people at Apple are reading it, people at Google are reading it, people at Microsoft, all these different companies. Um, and actually at the event this morning we had a lady from she's she's asked me not to say it publicly but it was a a government from a middle eastern country and she came over and said we've been using your reports for the last few years to guide government strategy i'm wondering if we can have a conversation about this tomorrow I was like so fucking lately we can <laughs> very exciting so all sorts of people students governments companies obviously journalists is a big part of it so we get a huge number of inquiries from respectable outlets so um, the wall street journal quite regularly we have a conversation there's a guy based in india who regularly wants the latest numbers on something and yeah, so it's a broad spread. And who and who is the who is the kind of weirdest company or business or country or person? You that prepped uses this question, it? didn't you? Based on our previous <laughs> conversation, um, I've had Pornhub. They didn't actually contact me directly. They wrote a very long blog post around one of the reports we did a couple of years ago, and I got freaked out because it um, the blog post linked back to my blog post, and you know I was still very nerdy at that point. I would check all my backlinks, and it said Pornhub is linked to, you. and I was like, oh my god, I've been hacked. What the hell's going on? And then I realised that Pornhub has an incredible analytics. It's the A N A L itics. But, sorry. Um, <coughs> moving on. Um, did they? <laughs> Everybody's groaning for listeners um, that can't hear and see the size. Um, but no, they, they've got this amazing analytics part of their business and they were looking at the amount of time that people spend online in different countries and then sort of aligning that to some of their data on what people are doing <laughs> on Pornhub by country as well. And so what do you put the success of the report down to? Uh, the, mainly giving it away for free. So we give those 5,000 charts away completely for free and it answers a lot of the basic questions that people need to have answers to but don't desperately want to spend a lot of money to find so especially if you're a you know if you're a small business you've got a marketing team of one you need to know whether you should be investing your money in facebook or instagram you just want some basic numbers that are reliable and you can track over time and we make that available to everybody and especially journalists you know they don't want to be spending days researching who what's the latest number of people using this in this country they just want a single source and so then how do you monetize that so that's five thousand slides I know it's all third-party data mostly. Yes. It certainly wasn't recent Almost all years. of it. Yeah. Um, so how do you then turn that into a business? <laughs> so that answers all of those low-level questions that I just mentioned. But with every low-level question answered, you immediately move on to a higher-level question. And so, you know, we, we put our branding, obviously. So it's a We Are Social and Hootsuite branded activity. I've got my contact details at the end of that, as well as the contact details of... Um, some of the other you know, ways of getting in touch with the businesses that are a part of the report. Um, we just get inquiries all the time. So if you think about it, 5 million people reading that, out of that you only really need three or four people a year to have a need for either deeper data or to say, great, these are lovely numbers, what do I do with them? And so um, I'm assuming no one knows about Kepios. So mm. they, they go, this surface level data is really interesting. Oh, I should be on this, this channel in this country at this time for this audience. So what kind of inquiries come to you? So most of the ones that you just mentioned there, where it's sort of talking about a platform or something like that, then that would go through to a We Are Social or a Hootsuite because that's, you know, that's the business that they're in. When you've got, say, a conference that wants to have somebody presenting on the future of digital in Asia, that's the sort of thing that I would do and most of that's paid speaking engagements. So that's kind of how I make a lot of the money is... So, that, so that's interesting. That's a regular gig for you is to, talking about the future, even though the, the product is retrospective. Yeah, isn't it funny? But I think that the nice thing about the numbers that we've collected, because we've now done seven reports, each you know annual report. So over seven years, you start to see the trend. So it's relatively not, not straightforward and you can't do it with massive confidence, but you can see it's going this way and you can see deviations and whatever else. So a lot of the time, so I'm, I'm noticing a lot of the underlying really small bits of, and data that you can then start to translate into much more interesting insights. So last year, for example, we were the first to report on the fact that there are more 18-year-olds using Facebook than there are 18-year-olds in the world. And that then got picked up by all sorts of other companies that pretended it was their data. So talk through that. So um, <laughs> this, is, this has got even more complicated this year. So if you look at the data of 
Facebook's active users. There are more Facebook user accounts that report being 18 years old than there are 18-year-olds alive in the world today. And by what? Like 20% more 18-year-olds? So like what we look <coughs> this year it's 12% more, um, but it varies considerably by country. So that's the global figure. Um, but you get into certain countries and it's we're talking quite startling figures. I'm not going to reveal them yet because we need to sort of check that data a bit more before I'm comfortable talking about it. But we're talking double and more. But So this is really interesting. It, it varies massively by culture and by country, but a lot of that is driven by things like vanity. So me pretending that I'm 18 when I'm not. A lot of it is data privacy issues. I don't want to tell Facebook how old I am, so I'll just tell it I'm 18. So it's not just weird stuff that's going on. There is some weird stuff going on in what there as well. What kind of weird stuff's going on? So there's a little bit of... So there's, there's I, I want to stress, because this is probably going out publicly, I want to stress that this is not a Facebook-created issue. This is dodgy third parties creating profiles for their own commercial benefit. So you do have, around the world, click farms that are basically creating these profiles that then click on adverts that those click farms are selling to unsuspecting advertisers. So they make a huge amount of money selling adverts to people that don't exist that they've created themselves. And an awful lot of those advertisers want to target the sexy young things. You know, if you're an 18-year-old, then you're a pretty lucrative kind of target for a lot of brands. And so, yeah, you're seeing a lot of 18-year-olds being the desirable audience that these brands want to relate to. So to stitch a couple of those sentences together and tell me if I'm doing that in the wrong way, <laughs> that like in some countries, there's almost twice as many 18-year-olds on Facebook as th actually exist. And the large majority of that extra 50% of 18-year-olds is coming from click farms. Now, I, I wouldn't necessarily put my name to saying the large majority of that definitely plays a factor in some countries, especially in Southeast Asia. That's a particularly important issue. And we've seen this reported in the news. So they, they walk into a, there was a click farm in Thailand on the border um, and they had 350,000 SIM cards. Now, each of those is going to be a user profile, whether that's on Facebook or another platform. Mm. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's difficult to say with any confidence, but that's what that one, which is banks and banks of phones and, you know, individual phones, individual SIM cards, then, and they've got systems that control it. So each of those individual SIM cards has its own user profile, and that user profile is doing things on Facebook or on Twitter or whatever else it may be. So you know, I would imagine there's a very similar sort of process to the, the, uh, the way that governments have been manipulating elections, for example, that you're going to have large numbers of profiles that need to be involved in this to make it work at scale and it's it's farms that are doing that and so how do brands defend against that you've got to buy your media from reliable sources it's the only way of doing it so if you're buying it from a suspicious third party that's giving you incredibly good rates compared to what you've seen from reputable companies if it's too good to be true it's probably a scam um the vast majority of advertising that goes through platforms like facebook is totally legit so even though there are these significant numbers of fake users, they probably account for an incredibly small part of the overall total. It's just that you need lots of them to make that business work. So, um, so that's a, <laughs> that is a, an amazing story. And I've seen the, the photos of these click farms. Mm. It's, it's really, it, it, it is literally just a farm of phones that um, you know, yeah. people are using. It's incredible. Um, so what are, the, what are the other anomalies or interesting quirks in the report? That, like, What's your kind of favourite thing that you've noticed? My favourite number this year, if I'm allowed to have a favourite child, uh, the favourite number this year was that people will spend a billion years online in 2018. A billion years, that's not, not a typo if you can speak a typo. So a bit of a bugbear of mine mm. is large numbers in marketing conversations. What, what does that mean? Like a billion, that's a, that sounds like a lot of years. It's a lot of years. But what is... So what do I do with that number as a As, as a, a marketer, you, well, I think as a brand, you don't do a great deal with it. As a marketer, where you still have to justify to the powers that be in your organization that they should be investing money in digital, it staggers me that we still have to have these conversations, but we do. Um, so the average internet user spends six hours a day on the internet already. So as you start to break that down, four billion internet users, six hours a day translates into a billion years of human time in 2018, right? So you then look at it and you go, that's interesting. Four billion people, more than half the world's population. Most people now use the internet. That is a very important fact, and that's across every country in the world, and from newborn babies through to the age of 100. So 53% of the world's population now using the internet. The six hours is an average, so you've got countries like Thailand where people are spending nine and a half hours a day on average on the internet, and then you've got countries like Japan where they're only spending an hour and a half, two hours a day on the internet. And it varies quite considerably by culture, by age, by you name it. So... 
you then start to look at, okay, so if the average is six hours, what are they doing in those six hours? And we got some great data in this year's report from App Annie. So, you know, most of the activity that is connected activity at the moment is through a mobile device. Um, so if you start looking at the apps that people are using, then it's, it's amazing to see the stuff that they're doing. So um, the app categories that are amongst the top 100, top 200 downloaded and most used, it covers just about every aspect of life. So you've got the things you would expect, playing games, chatting with friends, um, watching videos, that kind of stuff. But then you've got things like finance apps, so the ability to sort of you know manage all of your com- household spending and buy stuff and whatever else, e-commerce, obviously. Uh, you've got health tracking, so you know whether it's as simple as counting the number of steps that you've done in a day right the way through to things like tracking your blood sugar levels for diabetes sufferers, whatever else. And just to qualify one point, mm. when of those six hours a day, mm. does that include... Uh, sleeping apps or Fitbit? Can do, yeah. So you've got, this is what we talked about earlier today as well, you've got people that are actually connected 24 hours a day um, and it will be, you know, I'm monitoring my sleep and it's sending data across. So yeah, six hours a day, let's face it, it's, it's a significant amount of time. So inevitably there's going to be some passive activity in there and there's also going to be some double activity. So I'm watching Netflix, chatting to my friends on WhatsApp. That's two activities. Um, I don't quite know the way that the... I, I don't know whether that's going to influence the amount of time because the amount of time what we're reporting there, the six hours a day, is based on surveys. So Global Web Index, the providers of that data, fantastic data, and they survey 18 million people is on their sample panel base around the world, and they go to these people and say, how much time typically do you spend on the internet a day? I believe it includes business time as well, so at work, internet time, but still, it's not like the duplicating time is actually going to influence the overall stuff. So... so- Sorry, we get kind of slightly cynical here. And, and That's unlike you. In, <laughs> in no way am I trying to devalue the report, quite the opposite. But so people are on the internet a lot, duh. No shit, Sherlock. Like, yep. what, um, and yes, there's that argument that budgets should be pushed in a digital direction. Yes, it's weird that we have to mm. argue these points. But what else is that report telling a brand in the UK that they can act upon? So it's helping you make choices between particular social channels, for example. So should you be on Snapchat or Instagram? This is something that marketers seem to battle with on a day-by-day basis. So we've got some numbers in there that will help to inform that for you. It's not there to answer your questions for you. It's there to inform the answers that you draw from a variety of different sources. In actual fact, if it's doing its job better, it's giving you better questions, not simpler answers a lot of the time. So it's got data in there about e-commerce, the fact that the UK amongst all the countries in the world, is the highest penetration for e-commerce and it's the greatest average spend per person. So 2,000 US dollars per person per year in the UK on e-commerce. And in fact, there's only... When you compare that then to GDP, there's only one other country where technically people are spending more. Now, it's, it's, it's weighted because of the GDP stuff, but only China spends more per person on a GDP average basis than the UK. So I'm going to take this radically off course here <laughs> um how like how do you do it technically how do you do the report what tools do you use <sighs> how do we do it so um an awful lot of it is manual uh, it's going to freak people out when i say that across twenty five thousand data points i do most of it manually but it is so we go across a whole series of different websites um so we've give me a snapshot of these websites what what's your top what's your top five yeah so um all of the sources are actually listed in the report itself so internet world stats collects internet user data for every country in the world we'll then sense check that across a whole series of other data points as well so sarah who is sitting behind the camera today you can't so you, see her you build out a, a spreadsheet oh yeah, yeah. That's how it's, it's massive massive excel spreadsheet it's huge numbers of tabs and ridiculous amounts of data but so yeah sarah will go into the government site for a country in kenya to see their telecoms agency to see what they're reporting as the number of active internet users is as well we'll then go to the cia fact book and we'll get some internet user numbers from them so especially for internet users because it's so complex and time consuming to gather the data for the original data source we report where we can four separate numbers for the internet user number because and then you average that out no, for the report no okay. so we choose the one that we think is most representative but we'll then report the other four as well so in the report from most countries in the world you'll see a series of different options and that is deliberate you know it, a lot of people say why why can't you just decide what it is it's like well i have done this is the one that i would use but yeah. i know that these can be politicized or you may think that they're not representative whatever you may just want to have a series of options to 
to choose from. So yeah, we, we collect a lot of that data manually. The Facebook stuff, the Facebook data we collect manually. So for 234? 239 like, countries. 239 countries, you... How many sources per country do you check in order to arrive at the number that you think is most representative? So there are a couple of data sources that provide a lot of the data. So between Global Web Index, Statista, and Google Consumer Barometer, they provide probably three quarters of the total volume of data. Um, but then in total across the whole report, there are well over 100 separate sources. Right. And so how long does it take you to do this? Most of, well... Have you got time to do this in <laughs> Fortunately. Um, so we spend most of the year sort of collecting ideas of where the data is going to be. I know... So when I sit down on the first day of doing the report proper, I know where I'm going to get most of that data from. So an awful lot of it is preparing in advance. You know, you, it's a bit like a squirrel. You're burying your, your acorn somewhere and you know where to go and find yeah. them. Um, but yeah, it mean, doesn't change the fact that you then have to actually extract the data and an awful lot of it is still manual. And that's great. I'm, I make it sound like I'm a bit moaning about it, but the fact that a lot of these data partners make that data available for free, the fact that I have to download it manually or copy and paste it in some cases, it's like it's a faff, but five million viewers justifies the, <laughs> the effort that goes into that. And, um, and we're kind of sat here at the end of that process and yes. it's been successful again, which is fantastic. What are the kind of nauseating moments of doubt that you have with the report? Every year. So, you you know, you go through this massive stress and pain and then you publish it and you're exhausted. Uh, tell me, what's the stress and the pain? What, what's difficult about doing it? Uh, so there are, <laughs> there's one company that breaks my patience and frustrates me every single year. They will remain nameless, but they provide you most of the world's most popular business software. It crashes on a regular fucking basis and I lose days worth of hard work and it's just, it drives me mad. They also uh, look after the hosting solution that we use and the hosting solution changes the rules every five minutes. So we we spent days preparing the uploads to this hosting platform called SlideShare. And you know, we had everything ready and then the day that we're going to go and publish, they changed the rules on the fact that you're not allowed to change the underlying presentation. So you can't upload a new version of the presentation. So we spent days getting all this stuff ready and then they just changed the rules. And you were, you did used to be able to do that. You could yeah, just you could change it. And and so, so you only, on SlideShare, you can only now do You can't change one. it. You can upload it once and that's it. And you can't change it. And that's when you were saying, what are the nauseating pain points? If I spot a typo, because I'm really anal like that, I'm like, can't change it now. Can't, you know, all I want to do is just correct a spelling mistake in a source, you know, in like 0.7 font, but I've noticed it and it annoys me. I just want to change it. Cannot. So that's that's the nauseating, frustrated thing. I mean, every year you get the same group of people that come back and say, I can't find your data. And it's like, it's fucking here. Just read it. But you do then get a lot of people... You did ask, not say that. I did. <laughs> no, I, us I usually Customer don't. Customer service isn't I'm a massive usually, strong yeah. point. Me? <laughs> me? Being nice to people? Sod that. No, most of the time I'm incredibly nice to people that send in questions, but I do lose my patience with idiots. And there are idiots. You know, they'll send you five rounds of emails. like, oh, and I've got another question. I'm like, just read the same sources at the end of the report. It's there. But you, you do get some amazing questions as well. So people that are contacting you and saying, could it be this, could it be that? The funny thing is, as well, is we spend a lot... So Japan has been a place where we spent a lot of time working over the last few months. Um, and interestingly, the amount of time that people spend on the internet in Japan is very low. And I've been saying for the last, you know, the last couple of months, we've been touring around the world saying, I don't know why it's so low. And a lady came up at the end of the presentation today and she said, um, my aunt has just moved to Japan and she was telling me that you're not allowed to use your phone on the train. And I was like, yeah. She goes, yeah, and people commute for about four hours a day on trains in Japan, don't they? I was like, yeah. She goes, that's probably why they don't spend as much time online. I was like, oh my God, that's so obvious. It just hadn't occurred to me to put those two things together. Like, tell me a bit more about that. You can't use your phone on a train in Japan. Well, you can't, you can't talk on a phone. You're not really... So one of the things that drives me absolutely insane about society today... I start kicking fag packets into the gutter at this point as well. But kids that get onto public transport and watch their YouTube videos at full fucking volume... I, Really? At what point did that seem like a socially acceptable thing to do? What's wrong with you? Yes, well done. You want the world to know that you're doing things, but this is not the way to do it. So, you know, a lot of the time that in Japan just would not happen. You may get the occasional freak that does listen to something loud, but, you know, if they're going to have a phone conversation in anywhere public, they're going to a very private place and you know, whispering into their phone sort of thing. So they're not going to be watching videos at loud volume on the train. If they do, then they've got headphones in. So um, and what other unusual uh, trend booking digital behavior as the report on earth. So it was interesting this year that the amount of time people spend on social media has gone down slightly. 
I think a lot of that is that we've got slightly better at using these things. So we were perhaps doing a little bit less of the just aimlessly scrolling through feeds and we're going on there with a bit more purpose to our activity. Um, I don't think there's anything that stood out as being a dramatic kind of, oh my God, that's the world has changed since last year. There's, it's mainly incremental change year on year. And so what, what if any, is the new data? Either that was new data that was in this report or like new data that's going to be in the next three or four or five years. Yeah, we almost doubled the number of data points in this year's report. So there was a lot of new stuff. Um, so we got um, some great data from LocalWise, who are a social listening company. They gave us insights into Facebook reach and engagement data for about 180 countries around the world. Just amazing data. Um, got new stuff from App Annie, so they were great. They shared some stuff with us. Um, and it, um, what I mean is, it, it's great you have new data sources, but save things like um, motion tracking data from ah, right, Fitbits yeah. or voice data or a, a smart yes, like so that, self-driving car data. That kind of data, we're not at the stage where we're able to collect it consistently for a sufficient number of countries that we report it. So especially where it is data like... Suppose it's the data that a Fitbit collects, for example. It's not the sort of thing we would include in this. So it's very much focused on data that will help you make business decisions about using digital. So should I invest more in promoting my e-commerce platform? Should I build an e-commerce platform? It's that kind of stuff that will be helping you to make decisions on rather than how many people are counting steps. I would like to have that kind of data, but a lot of the time it's very difficult to get it across more than just one supplier so for example fitbit doesn't represent the entire wearables market much as they're a big player and to get that data across all those different players would just be close to impossible on a practical basis so can you tell me uh without um getting in any confidentiality problems but <laughs> <laughs> I've made it like a, it's just a terrible terrible thing but James can you tell me about a brand story where they didn't know about the report they heard about the report and they, you approach them and their business has changed. What, what are the well, success stories at, as, associated with the brief that you could, you could tell us about? Did I mention the Middle Eastern government already? You did. I alluded to that earlier. So they, they yeah. said at the, at the end of today, they said this has changed government policy. I think if I'm changing government policy with a report, I'm, I'm fairly pleased with that result. And let's assume it's for the better. I would hope so. Well, yeah, look, I am, fully, I am fully aware that there are people using this data for bad means as well. That doesn't mean that the data should be put away. Um, it's funny. We get a lot of thank yous, but we don't get a lot of specifics. So it's not like, because of your report, I have done X, Y, and Z, and our company has whatever. I got a lot of nice messages from NGOs. So um, there was a, an NGO that was helping young people, so teens in Timor-Leste, to understand sexual health. I had a lady contacted me and saying, I just wanted to let you know that your data has completely changed the way that we approach this, and it saved us a significant amount of money, and we've reached more people with valuable information. So... That, that kind of stuff, you know, when you're going through the sleepless nights trying to collect all the data and you're fighting with the uh, famous software vendor. Um, yeah, it's very satisfying to know that you will be making a difference. And a lot of the time I am aware that it's just people sitting in middle management jobs collecting slides to put into their own presentations and it's not going to change the world. But there are moments when it does. So, yeah, that makes me feel slightly better. That's a, that is a, a great story. And often, often in this industry... You can be sitting there thinking, why are we talking so ardently about baked beans? <laughs> <laughs> I want to sell more soap. Yeah, definitely. Um, so what's next? So what, what does this report look like in, in five years' time? So it's funny, we've already been talking about next year's report. So we're only, what, was Mar 1st of March today. So we're only a month after we published the 2017, uh, 2018 report. And we're already talking about 2019 report. Um, <laughs> quite like a few months off before I get involved in making it yet. But I think a big part of the report next year is going to be taking the presentations out. So like the presentation that we did this morning that you mentioned, where we're actually translating the numbers into trends, into actionable activities as well. A lot more, I think, of next year will be about road showing the data. So, you know, the, the data is there in the report as a reference when you need it. But in all honesty, like I said, it's not going to it's there more as a way of getting the basic data that you need rather than giving you the high level answers to the questions that you care about most. And actually what it should be doing is asking those questions as well. So I think a lot more of next year will be about how do we inspire better questions amongst people. And do you have a plan to make the tool live? Is that possible? I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, there is a degree of 
technicality to that, but that's not a barrier. It's just a decision to do. The main reason why I've sort of held off on doing that is that people seem to prefer to have something that they can download. And the danger is if you're downloading something at any given point in time, it's going to change. It's very difficult for people to then have consistent conversations with each other. So I think that it, there would be a value in doing both. Um, but I think once you get into providing that data on a constantly updated basis, you get into some slight awkward challenges because people like Global Web Index, for example, that provide commercial data to us for free, they can only do that once a year and not really compromise their business. So things like I might I might get to the stage where we publish the sort of the, the hard hardcore, I don't mean that as hardcore, but you know the, the central core of the data which so the internet users, the social media users, the mobile users. So those are numbers that are updated that we can get on them on a regular basis. The social media numbers are a bit of a pain to gather because you have to do it manually. Um, we could theoretically be doing it on a more frequent basis, but actually having that consistent point of reference for everybody does have its advantages so i haven't said no yet but i've been thinking about it and i haven't convinced myself it's the right thing to do yet. yeah very different business <laughs> probably need some serious investment and yeah. then you'll be managing a team of developers and data scientists and that's Don't a whole different yeah and you probably want to you probably want to monetize that so you get into advertising and then you just get into it, it being a business rather than it promoting the business that you want to do so kepios is a business that i have sort of crafted into exactly what I want to do. So public speaking, helping brands that care about crafting something they're, you know, committed to doing. And when you start to get into just publishing data for a living, it gets a little bit <laughs> a little bit different. Definite uh, change in the tone of your voice there. Yeah, <laughs> look, I, publishing I have, data. I have huge living. amounts of respect for the data partners that provide that data to us that do that day in, day out. But it, it's <laughs> just not, not you. It's not me as Simon. It's not what I want to do day in, day out. And so the part of your presentation that I missed, which is quite frustrating, uh, was your... <laughs> to do some real work. Yeah, your, your vision for the future. Yeah. We talked about a, a bit about the impact of voice on the next billion internet users yeah. um, we touched on that last night I thought it was fascinating so I think people listening to this podcast would be really interested to hear that view cool so yeah voice control is one of those things that you've heard a lot about it's been massively hyped in the 2018 trends reports and whatever else but we're not talking about voice control in the context of something like an Amazon Echo I mean I think that's a great piece of tech but that's not what's going to change the internet for everybody in the world so let me backtrack a little bit um, the next billion I'm sure folks listening to the podcast know what we're talking about so people in mainly developed nations that are not yet online that will be coming online in the next three to five years. A billion people will connect most likely over that time. So we had 250 million people connect for the first time last year. So if you look at that, I mean, inevitably it will slow down slightly, but... Quick question. Mm. What did they do first? What did they do first? Do you know, based on... And inevitably each person does something slightly different, but one of the main drivers of getting people online is still social media. They want to be able to chat to their friends. So the first thing they do is they sign up to a Facebook. And that's the first thing. And then once they... Facebook specifically or the, the uh, region? Facebook is Facebook. still the biggest. So I mean, right. Facebook still grew significantly last year. And we were talking about... I don't remember the exact number, but I think it was double digit. It may even have been 15% growth year on year in terms of active users. Now, some of that may be duplication, but inevitably there's still real people significantly being the big part of that. So, yeah, I think they, they go online, they set up a Facebook account, and as soon as they're on Facebook, they see content that their friends have shared, and then off they go from there. And very quickly, you spend six hours a day on the internet reading about nonsense. So when I say nonsense, I mean that in the nicest possible way. But you know, the amount of time I spend watching BuzzFeed Tasty videos, for example... So there's no justification for me watching somebody making an Ebi Avocado burger five times, and yet I just I can't stop myself. I'm like, I must watch this for 20 minutes. So that's interesting. <laughs> the, the, first, the first act of people coming onto the internet for the first time is to, is to connect. For many people, yeah. So they want to be able to chat with friends and family, and social media is a very practical way of doing that. I think it's... You know, if you think about your own loved ones the fact that you just want to be able to drop them a message on whatsapp so even you and i when we were coordinating doing this recording it's like i'll be over in 10 minutes oh sorry i'm slightly late and it's it's a very very utilitarian practical thing but it has so much value Do you remember before the days of mobile phones when you were arranging to meet with your friends and you'd meet them at the clock tire at two o'clock and at 2 30 they still weren't there and you're like how long do i wait to realize whether you're not coming 
right? So I think it was just the fundamental changes that basic things like a WhatsApp or a WeChat or whatever else has introduced into just the way we all... We were talking about this the other day, about the fact that kids no longer actually make plans to meet each other. They're just like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll see you. And then it's like, where are you? What are you doing? Let's meet up. It's not like, let's catch up on Saturday. We'll not actually make a specific plan with a time to it. I, I just, yeah, I'm... I'm Obsessive compulsive. I have to have details. I can't deal with it. So uh, stepping back to the to the voice piece, so yes. you've got um, billions of people coming online over the next three to five years, mm. and they're they're not all going to buy an Amazon Echo first, which I'm obviously is your not. point. I'm guessing yeah. not. Unfortunately for Jeff, um, <laughs> I think he's okay without them yeah, anyway. He's but okay, won't he? Um, so what? What do you mean by they will be using voice and the internet first? So you've got a few challenges. Um, which have stopped people coming online already. Um, so those next billion, it's not that they don't want to come online for the most part, it's that there's been some kind of challenge or barrier that stopped them. So you've got basic things like technology infrastructure. So is there even mobile data in my area? Can I afford to buy a phone? Do I have access to electricity? So really fundamentally basic challenges. You've then got things like literacy. And this is one of the biggest issues that I think most people in the West have not got their heads around. When we talk about the next billion, it's not just a case of, oh, when, once they've got data, then off we go. So in parts of Africa, their literacy rates, even in audiences aged 15 and above, less than 50% of the audience can read and write to a proficient level that they can make sense of written text. The vast majority of content on the internet is still text-based. So, yes, you and I watch a lot of YouTube, I'm sure, but if you think about how many news articles you read, your WhatsApp messages are all text. When you think about it, and you know, if you think about it carefully, the vast majority of that content is still text-based. So if you're illiterate, you can't read it and you can't type stuff in, so you can't use WhatsApp either from that perspective. So literacy is the biggest challenge to getting people on the internet. But the good thing is we can, almost all of us, can have conversations. Even if we can't read and write, we've still got language. So you and I could quite happily have a conversation even if we weren't able to type stuff down. And the thing is, as soon as I get into a voice control world, I can start to say, okay, Google, take me to this website, or I'm looking for the nearest shop around me that sells potatoes, whatever it may be. You can speak that into a device and it will take you to the website. It will then read that website back to you. So you've got these great text-to-voice converters. So when we're talking about voice control, it's not clever, snazzy shit of add chips to my car, Alexa. It's much more, I can now access content and I can read it. And so how do you think that content is going to be served? Because you've you've applied an old model to like, a new paradigm, right? Which is, hey, Google, <laughs> tell me where the local shop is that sells potatoes or whatever yeah. it is. And then you, you made the assumption, rightly or wrongly, that this, uh, this voice tool is going to read back a website. But in actual fact, it probably won't work like that. It'll no. probably be much more based around it'll probably assistance, say, right? Yeah, so, so it'll probably say walk down the road 100 metres and turn left and you'll be there. I mean, it, it will be a lot more practical than I think. It, it's but what I mean is, is it going to be a, is it going to be a Google service or a Facebook service or an Amazon service or whoever it is reading back websites or will, in order for a, a voice service to work, will it need a much more recognizable interface, which is just a person, like a character and an assistant? Because if, if the voice assistant said something like, I'm going to read you from the website, X, Y, Z. Then, then what's a website? Yeah. Like, you know, so will there, will there need to be some form of character or assistant or a, an Alexa or a mm. Siri or a Google Assistant to f perform that function? It doesn't need to be. There's a big business opportunity in creating one. So if you look at Siri, Siri isn't just about functionality. There's a massive, massive revenue opportunity for Apple in Siri. Um, I don't think that it's a necessity to make it work. So I think you will probably find that the phone device that you have will have an inbuilt function in the same way that it's got ways for you to just type stuff into a browser. I think you'll probably find that there's a basic voice tool that's in there. And it's still going to be brand-centric, so it'll still be an Apple tool versus a Samsung tool versus whatever else. You'll still see the Android versus iOS dichotomy in there. But I don't think it's to sort of the level that I think you're alluding to of, you know, will this be a completely different platform. I think in the short term, at least, we will probably see voices just being a way of accessing existing content. It will evolve over that. The sensible 
content producers will realise that for a voice world, they can do things very differently. You don't need to make a website if you've got voice. I heard an interesting story the other day. Uh, that have you ever used Moto Read? No. It's, a, it's an app and Chrome plugin where if you find... If someone sends me an article during the day, I can't read it because my brain's just not in, like, sit down, spend 25 minutes on something. Can't do it. Yep. So what you do is you click on the motor read icon and it reads that page and dumps it all into your app as an audio file. Oh, wow. So then you can listen back to it. And so what I'll do, if you sent me an article, oh, Simon, I'm not reading that now, click on the article, goes into the app. So then the following morning on the tube on the way in, you can listen to it, right? And you can, hmm. but then what you can do, this is where it starts to get quite weird, is you can turn up the speed and you train your brain, <laughs> train your brain to listen to articles at three times the speed. It's like listening to me talking normal, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Speak um, fast. And so I was telling someone of this story and they said uh, apparently um, uh, blind people uh, read the internet at five times speed. So, that when Holy they're looking at a website, shit. they'll just suck down that information at five times speed, and everything else seems like really laboriously slowly. So, if that, if you extrapolate out from there, that this next billion people are going to listen to the internet five times speed, which means they can get through information five times quicker, which means that potentially five times more efficient and effective. So, <laughs> are, are this next billion people going to be operating on the internet five times more effectively than we are? I think well, hopefully all of us will get to this stage where we're more efficient, but in the same way that a lot of these people in developing countries leapfrogged from nothing to mobile devices without going through desktops, that you'll probably find that they are much quicker to adapt to those new technologies. So voice search has been around for a long time. It's not like it's a new development, and you and I still don't use it as much as we should, whereas these guys are going to jump straight into using voice search, and it's going to be their primary. Even if you go to India now and people are perfectly literate, they're still using voice search a lot better because... It's a bit of a hassle to type in Hindi characters compared to English and whatever else. It's just actually it's an awful lot more straightforward to ask. You know, just just hold it up and go, "Okay, Google." So how are the so how are the social network giants going to deal with a, a voice driven internet? So if you've got an, a yeah. billion people who don't have a screen, mm. they just have a speaker and a microphone, and they're talking to the internet. And yes, they're going to call their friends. You can understand how a service like WhatsApp might work there, yep. or, or or a WeChat. But you know, these these are services or Skype. They're predominantly voice systems. What what's Instagram going to do for a billion people when they have only got a voice and a microphone? Are they going to say you're looking at a square picture yeah, of yeah. a plate of food in Hoxton? Screens aren't going to disappear anytime soon, but the amount of time we spend on screens as part of our digital experience will drop quite considerably. But I'm not going to stop watching movies just because there's a voice world. So much, much as I love podcasts and the fact that we're doing one has a certain irony, I'm still going to want to watch epic content. I'm still going to want to watch videos. I'm still going to even watch videos without the sound on. So this just provides you with more options, especially when it comes down to an efficiency and convenience perspective. So if I want directions, so we were talking about the fact that it's been snowing crazily in London today. I don't want to take my phone out and take my gloves off to try and open the map to find my way to Tom's office. I just want it to speak to me in my ear and say, turn left here. So I get that, but that you, you switch the conversation into a, like a, a Western viewpoint. I'm just focusing on this next billion mm. people, right? Okay. Cause it's going to be easy. It's going to be cheaper to serve the billion people with an internet, with a microphone and a speaker yeah. than it is to have a microphone and a speaker and a screen. Yeah, correct. I think it's unlikely that you would... I don't think the majority of people will have a, a device that doesn't include a screen. It will be an option, but I think you'll probably find that most of them want to watch videos. So um, Facebook, very clear that video is the future for both Messenger as well as the vanilla platform. Um, WhatsApp, if you open up WhatsApp now, ironically, it's a text-based platform, but the camera button is at the, the center of the interface. It's just that we're not using it that way yet. But WhatsApp will look very similar to Skype very soon. It will just be you and I having video chats. So I think even for people in that part of the world, and if you look at the way that they're using this now, they are kind of doing that. They're having video chats more frequently because you know they, if they can't type messages, then they are. So you go somewhere like China, for example, you look at WeChat. The way that people use WeChat is that they don't type anything anymore. They speak. So it's audio-based. Ironically, they still have a screen that they tap to then trigger that, but it's it's listening and doing this kind of weird stuff. So the the future of the internet for these next billion people will be massively video centric, audio and voice, video, yeah. voice driven. Correct. So so looking forward again, what are the trends and technologies that are making you 
feel a bit confused and weird. What, confused. What, what challenges you and you think, I don't understand this. Why is this happening? It's more people's behaviours that I don't understand. Why do people still take photos of their lunch every day and upload them to Instagram? Um, oh, I'm sorry, I've, I've missed the video. Um, I'm going to get closer to you, Tom. Um, I don't think there's anything to confuse it. There's things that I look at and I get very excited about that I don't know as much as I would like about. So blockchain, it's a totally overhyped thing, but I don't know nearly enough about how the technology itself works. I can see all the benefits of it, and I can see how it's going to change the world, but uh, it's not like I feel I'm a massive expert in these kinds of things. Artificial intelligence, one of our favourite stories. I kind of look at that and I think, again, there's an awful lot of hype that goes around it. But there are elements of it that I look at and think, no, this this really is going to change the world very quickly in ways that we can't even imagine. So we, we were speaking yesterday uh, as part of a separate conversation um, about creativity and artificial intelligence. And I sort of look at that and I think this is staggering because you've got artificial intelligence, which an awful lot of the time at the moment is logic based. But when you start to get out of that into more imaginative, um, dare I say, emotional territories it starts to get really really interesting because a lot of creativity is it's very much about that right brain activity in a human and the, the funny thing is you can do right brain thinking for devices as well it's about experience it's about understanding what stimulates a certain kind of response and a lot of this comes down to the idea of machine empathy i know that an awful lot of people are going to be listening to this like what how can a machine be empathetic but the weirdest thing about empathy is that it varies by culture, which suggests that it's totally learnt. And anything that's learnt, you can encode. And if you can encode it, it becomes an algorithm, and therefore you can feed it into some kind of artificial intelligence system as well. Now, technically, if you ask me to write a code on that, I have no idea where to start. But, you know, I start thinking about the applications of that once it's possible. It becomes absolutely fascinating, because if you've got a machine that is genuinely empathetic to other machines... You remember, did you ever watch War Games, the movie with Matthew Broderick back in the day? Yes, back in the day. So uh, for those viewers and listeners who have not watched this movie, basically, I'm, I'm going to have to give you a spoiler to ruin the story. But nonetheless, you've got these um, war, war simulators that basically end up almost triggering a nuclear war. But just before they actually launch the real missiles, they realize that nuclear war is pointless because they've run through every possible scenario and every possible scenario is that everybody dies. An empathetic system is going to come to that conclusion incredibly quickly. It's going to run through all of this and go, I don't understand the benefit of annihilating everybody. And the funny thing is that an artificially empathetic system can be a lot more rational if it chooses to be, or it can dial up the level of emotion to feed into that if it wants to. So it becomes a really sort of... I can see you've got lots of questions, so I'll stop. I'll just t tell me more about how you think that a machine can actually be empathetic. I can understand that it can it can synthesize different responses depending on how people have responded emotionally, but it's not actually going to empathize. There will be no empathy. It will be creating the illusion of empathy. Allu yeah, the, the illusion of. But the funny thing is, right, that empathy has two elements to it. There, the, the most sort of common definition of empathy is the ability to identify, understand, and sort of internalize other people's feelings. So I can see that you're sad, and I relate to that because I've been sad myself, and therefore I know what you're going through. But the important bit about empathy, in all honesty, the fact that I've identified and understood that doesn't mean anything to you. It's only when I change my behavior with you that the benefits of empathy come through. Knowing that you feel what I feel and vice versa is important, but it's, it's what that then does for our relationship. And you can see how systems can empathise with us by they changing... They can behave empathetically, Correct. but they can't empathise. No. And it's, it, I was reading this interesting article the other day. Um, it was in Wired, and it was basically saying that Google have won advertising without understanding it. Mm -hmm. So they, they said, this website is popular because all these people have linked to it. Don't know what's on it, don't really care. Do you want to buy some ads? Yeah. So they're, they've, they've, they're the most powerful, well, one of the most powerful forces in advertising without having any any understanding of it. So I, I think it's conceivable that machines will be able to do a similar job with emotion, yeah. but they will never feel anything. They'll never but do they need to? I no. still get the benefit. But then if it's not empathy if they don't feel it. But it is, because if it's changing the way that it treats me based on my emotional state and my emotional reactions, then that is the benefit of empathy 
So the way that you react to me when I'm emotional versus the way the machine reacts to me when I'm emotional, if I get the same benefit from both of those things, what's the difference? I know instinctively that it's different, but this, this is a little bit like AI and art, right? So if you look at any kind of AI creative output at the moment, you give it to a critic and they'll be like, oh, it lacks soul and blah, blah, blah. If you don't tell them that it's created by a machine, most of them have no idea. And they just analyze it like any other music or piece of art or whatever else it may be. A lot of this is our reaction to the fact that it's a robot. We're not empathizing with the machines. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but it will come to the stage where we need to empathize with them as much as they need to empathize with us because we rely on them for so much stuff. So, yeah, I've wait, got me on to my, <laughs> my favourite favorite subject here, really. Uh, my, my whole view about creativity and machines is that a lot of creativity is down to context. Yeah. So uh, there's a, a professor of computational creativity, a guy called Simon Colton, mm -hmm. who presented it, I'll be back, uh, um, uh, a little while ago. And it, he talks about a poem, and he reads out a poem, however long this poem is. And he said, uh, you know, that poem was written by into it, poet, whatever. And then he says, right, well, actually, um, that poem was written by uh, a woman, not a man. And and then, oh, well, that puts a slightly different change on it. And actually, that uh, that poem was written by a child. And once again, you're like, what, really? And then he goes, actually, that poem was written by a paedophile. And then your brain spit. And then eventually he says, that poem was written by a computer. And the only thing that's changed is is you, is the context. Yeah. The, the thing exactly itself that. has has stayed the same. And I think that, in the, I think I like the art argument that a, a computer can't create art because so much of the art is the context, right? So I'm going to totally no, flip that on its that head. It can take what, and what a computer can do is create content it can create media yes. but an uh, art depends on the context so look at um you know duchamp's uh, toilet bowl where he's you know write a name on it right it's all context it's it's con it's conceptual so if even if a machine i mean we've seen ibm do it then they, they rewrote uh, like a beatles song or something mm -hmm. Well, they didn't really. They sort of came up with a chord progression, and someone else wrote a song over the top of it. But like, <laughs> let's let's assume uh, for the for the moment that they did actually create that thing. Mm. That it it was com completely nothing like a Beatles song because the context of the Beatles doing it was completely removed. It just it was media that was representative yeah. of. 105 tracks that they release. But you've got things like the next Rembrandt. So they analysed 30 or 40 different Rembrandt paintings and how he structured those and his choice of colours and pose and everything. And they created a brand new painting. But the context was the case study and the technology. Correct. The actual, the, the thing in itself was unremarkable and fundamentally useless and unsellable because it's not a Rembrandt. It's, it has nothing to do with Rembrandt. But yeah. the, what makes it interesting is the story. Yeah, but it's exactly that. Everything in art is a story that we tell ourselves as the... So you've got beauties in the eye of the beholder, but value is in the heart of the beholder. So you look at... You know, let's look at Banksy. I mean, I love Banksy's work, right? But it's a stencil that he's taken and he sprayed it onto a wall. What makes that better than somebody who scribbled their name on the wall? It's totally the story that we tell ourselves. When you get to a Jackson Pollock piece of art, right? I mean... I really like his work, but seriously, I've taken squiggles of paint and that's worth millions of dollars. And yet a kid at nursery school could do exactly the same thing. It's not worth million dollars because why? And it's the why that's that, the why is the story, the context. right? Because the kid doing it is the, the, the context is, well, that's a child messing around with paint. The context of Jackson Pollock doing it is a completely different thing because he was the first or one of the right. first to innovate in that space. Innovate. So that's So that's where I... And I, well, part of my role is to understand the relationship between artificial intelligence and art, so brands can make use of use of that. <laughs> and I, and I think where we're lucky as uh, advertisers and brands and agencies is because we control the context. Yeah. So if we go right, we're going to show a rectangle to a person on a mobile on a bus in Chelmsford on a Saturday, as long as that results in the desired action, then the the context is justified. But yeah. it's for a machine to create art without any context, other than it being a machine, I think is a very difficult thing to get around. But it's what you said. It's the story that you tell that makes it the difference between content and art, right? And most of that... Wow. We're, uh, we're getting deep. We are. But the, the really interesting <laughs> thing is that an awful, lot of the, so well. an awful lot of that story is about empathy. 
It's understanding your emotional reaction to it. So music is all about emotional reaction. Art is all about emotional reaction. Going to have to pull you up on that. I think music is, is all about context. Yeah, but it's an emotional reaction to it. If I hear a sad song on a happy day versus if I hear the same song on a sad day, I have a very different response to it. I then have an experience and the number of times I hear it, it changes what it means to me as well. It's, it's, a, very in, it's a very subjective response, right? You and I will respond to exactly the same song slightly differently or dramatically differently. So you like indie, I love techno. If I played you some of my favorite techno tracks, you'd be like, this is just noise. And yet for me, it genuinely does touch emotions that nothing else can reach. And that's purely context. I know it's, it's a very subjective and emotional thing. And it's, it is actually the same bits of sort of hormone and brain biological processing as empathy. It's, it's the way that I internalize an external stimulus and then respond to it. So I, I think we're in violent agreement here. But what's interesting is that there is nothing to stop a machine that becomes empathetic being able to take something that is merely content and tell a story around it that makes it into art in the same way that Jackson Pollock or whoever else it may be has done. So there's there's no reason why a machine wouldn't be able to. So you, if you've watched her, the movie, and he falls in love with his personal assistant, yeah. where we've got to the stage where we have that level of relationship, if that personal assistant does start telling us about the fact that they absolutely love this new font that they've seen, and you have such a relationship with them that they influence the way that you perceive that font, you can very easily see how these things progress. Now, whether it whether the machine loves the font or not is a different question because it doesn't feel emotions in the way that we do but if it knows that i like these things what you've done with the that example is you've created a context within which the creativity will be valuable to you mm -hmm. so you by responding to the the her ai mm. will tell you you will tell that ai a lot about yourself and it will learn about mm. you and so you will justify to yourself that ai is is useful for you so yeah. then if they, that AI says buy a green jumper then the context is that that choice is the right one yeah. but, only, but it's all it's ever really doing is reflecting your own choice so in, in, in actual fact you're making the choice yeah but and, then that, and that AI would be a kind of proxy version of, of your own choices anyway it may not be quite as filter bubble as that though. so it may go out and look at lots of other people as well so it may know that i have an incredible like for the style of ryan gosling and it analyzes his thing and it recommends to me a the style, of, style ryan gosling. of ryan gosling but this happens in real life right so if you, if that's its own podcast so. <laughs> <laughs> if i think about my fashion your light's gone off by the way i don't know if oh, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, sorry folks it? we've run out of battery on the light if i think about my fashion choices since i got married my wife has had a significant Hello, wife. My wife has had a significant influence on choices that I make from a fashion perspective because she tells me things and I care about the way she feels about it. And if you think about that, it's very easy to see how you'd move into a situation where we depend on the advice of a personal artificial intelligence system and that then influences our choices. Now, it might be out there. It might be scanning hundreds of thousands and millions of images across the Internet to help me identify images or styles that I want to achieve and then recommending based on that. So it's not just that it learns what I like. It learns what I like in a broader context. It looks at what my friends are sharing. And ideally, and in the best of all possible worlds, all assistants are talking to other assistants and you end up in this perfect understanding of Well, there's objectives a huge, and... huge gulf missing there because what... It's a, a good way to describe it is a joke that Alex Hobhouse always tells at our event. He says, uh, a machine learning algorithm walks into the bar and the barman says, what are you having? And he says, what's everyone else having? <laughs> Which I think is a really nice way of yeah. saying, like, you can only choose based on what are their, like, internal data or external data that it, it can get its hands on. But what a machine can't do, and I haven't even seen... One instance of this is making a conceptual link between two unrelated things. Oh, not yet. So, it, I mean, is it Move Thirty Seven in AlphaGo in like the in okay. the first game where it was? Oh, I don't know anything about Go, but I'll watch the documentary on Netflix. <laughs> and, then, and they basically like, they, they, they move this this piece on the boards, and everyone's like, "Wow, oh my God! Like that's 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 an incredible move. That was creative." And I obviously they, I wouldn't even get in the door at DeepMind, um, let alone get a job there. Um, but that wasn't creative. It was just based on previous data. What it wasn't doing was um, making a, 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 a contextual link between two things that weren't related. And that is at the core of what creativity is, is the ability to link two separate ideas 
and think, right, okay, that now becomes my idea, whether that's a joke or a melody or a song or a rhythm or an advertising campaign or a strap line. You need to join two previously unrelated things. And that yeah, currently... Imagination, right? Yeah. Innovation, so, inventiveness. But and a machine can't do that. I think, I, I'm not going to disagree with that, but I think we are giving ourselves way too much credit as humans. Tell me the number of human beings that you know that walk into a bar and don't choose based on what other people are having. Uh, every cho- you go into the bar downstairs now and you watch how many of them gone in with a totally original thought of I want blackberry juice mixed with whiskey please because I'm an innovative thinker no bullshit we go in and we follow what marketing has told us what our friends told us what our experience and our heritage told us and even when you look at the ways that we recombine two completely unrelated things that is a totally cultural aspect if you look at the way that people in the Middle East do it versus the way that people in the Far East do it it's totally different because there is such a strong degree of experience and cultural influence on that. So I'm not saying that we don't do it, but I think we, we've sort of missed the point that it's not like it is 100% isolated and separate when we come up with these ideas. If you look at a child learning how to put a look together, I'm going to back to my Ryan Gosling style here. Now, if you think about children and the way that they learn to put things together, they, they sometimes put the most ridiculous items together and their parents probably go, you're not going out of the house looking like that, it's interesting, but no. And they learn over time that certain combinations are better than others. And whether it's fashion, whether it's music. So you put a child then in front of a piano, it's blink, 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 and it's like, I'm making noise, I'm happy. But a dog could do the same thing. And over time, we learn what other people like, what we like. And there are the genuinely, incredibly creative, innovative people that you know, come out of nowhere with such a completely unusual sound. So I still remember the first time I heard Bjork, for example. I'm just going, what the fuck? This is so different to what I'm used to. And yet I listen, listen back to it now, and it's like, because she's influenced so many things later, you kind of go, yeah, it wasn't that original really, was it? No, it was. It's just that it, it then influenced everybody else and her way of being original influenced other people being original as well. And I think if you listen to, if you speak to Bjork and you ask her what influenced her, she will say, actually, all these things influenced my originality and creativity as well. There is no such thing as a totally unique original thought. It's always two things that have existed already. You just put them together in a slightly new way. Yeah, I'm not arguing that. I think that's, that's a very really succinct way of putting it. But a machine can't do that. But it can. It's just that we don't see the value of it. And I think this is where we're going to get to really interesting state in creativity for AI is we as the human observer judge all of those outputs based on our collective experience and what we think it should look like based on our needs. But what happens when an AI critic judges an AI piece of output. Because, uh, let's face it, a critic is just another human being that is subjective, and sure, they may have experience of judging thousands of bits of art, but when somebody says, Jackson Pollock is the next big thing, that critic has a massive influence on it, but it's still just fucking squiggles of paint, with no disrespect to Jackson Pollock. Somebody somewhere decided that this was art versus some kid that had spilt paint on a piece of canvas. And I think when you get to the stage where artificial intelligence judges other artificial intelligence and decides, is this delivering the outcome that the original brief was there to deliver, it doesn't matter whether I like it as a human being. If it's a better way of delivering the outcome I wanted, I just have to accept that that's a better way of doing things. So what's the impact that's going to have on social? So if you... <laughs> you so came back to social no, no, media like, for that. Right, it, was, it was Helena's point. I think it's really interesting that if you've got AIs that are, can produce acceptable copy, acceptable yeah. video, acceptable, accept, acceptable, acceptable images and music and whatever... And then you've got the whole social listening piece mm. of the internet. Mm. So you're going to have AIs mm-hmm. listening to AIs. You you're going to have... Totally. Them, you already you've got uh, AI influencers. I mean, yeah. pretty niche at the minute. But at some point, you know, you're going to have... You're going to have digital celebrities that have never existed that will... Like Tay. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Awkward. Well, what we've done with AlphaGo, we've done Tay, what have we got left? Um, Still got to do driver, driverless cars. Yeah, course, we've done the next Rembrandt as well. Um, well, yeah, the bonus point there. So how... So, and to tie it back into your into your report... <laughs> Tenuous, but okay. Bring no, it back so, to that. Okay, so you're, you're providing a, a report that tracks the activity of digital behavior uh-huh. in 239 markets around the world. So um, how are you uh, and other people in the research and insight profession going to be able to tell what is a robot and what isn't? And I, is don't, it, is I it don't think that matters as much as we want it to. 
I think what matters is the outcome that it delivers. If it's an AI influencer that changes my behavior versus a human influencer, does it matter? The, the result... So I'm, I'm going to be quite idealistic and but black and white Going back this. to your point about the, the, the <laughs> server farms, so presumably those, those will get be made obsolete by by AIs that can just, like whether it's a robot in sat in front of a thousand little phones, like clicking like on all mm. these different images. So that's going to, that will that system will get automated as well, presumably. I think it is already, yeah. But I think when you get to a situation where we become a lot more effective and efficient at influencing, whether it's influencing me directly or influencing my personal artificial intelligence system, assistant, that then influences my behavior. I think we're going to get to a stage, it's probably a decade at least off. So anybody that says anything beyond four years as a prediction means that it's probably more magic than science. But I think you are in a situation now where I, I'm not convinced that a lot of these distinctions matter as much as we want them to as human beings. It's like watching The Matrix and saying, oh, we're, we're going to fight to be, the vast majority of human beings would prefer to be sitting in that comfortable little test tube just existing and pretending that they're having a happy life because we pretend we have a happy life when we're miserable at the moment, most of us. So I think that whole idea of does it matter whether a machine has changed my perspective versus a human being? So that's an interesting point. So I get that, that, yeah, I mean, personally, I you know, don't really care as long as the output is good. As long as I'm happy you know, as as and nobody else has suffered. Yeah, that's fine. But in terms of you know reporting on human behavior, mm. like uh, it is it going to put the research and insight profession into a bit of doubt because no, we, we're not so. going to be able to work out whether that... And we always said it today that there's a, a, a number of 18-year-olds that don't actually exist. Yeah. Like, will will it, we get to a point where an, an AI can create a fiction far quicker than we can spot it? Yeah, and I think that's the point where, as an industry, research and insight needs to realise that there's a difference between measuring the means and measuring the end, and far too much of the time we're measuring intermediate steps so measuring the number of likes on a facebook page has diddly squat value most of the time it's did somebody's behavior change so when we're looking at you know, measuring what matters we need to ch measure changes in behavior we need to probably measure changes in perceptions and attitudes as well but ultimately what influences those well, you work backwards so was it a machine versus was it a human you then have that you know bit existential question of does it matter you might want to know which one has a greater impact but i think it's much more that research and insight then needs to focus on the outcome measurement and not the intermediate step measurement we're going to have to get a lot better at understanding what real value looks like instead of just having metrics that we can count and therefore thinking because we can count them they count they don't the number of likes i have on my facebook page really doesn't matter that much until it translates into end value so we need to wrap up here. <laughs> we could go on all day. We could. Um, so just to look back, we've talked about the report, where it came from, uh, some of the the interesting stories, some of the actual positive benefits it's had directly mm -hmm. on, um, on sometimes policy and sometimes education in different markets. I think that's brilliant. Um, and then we got massively <laughs> sidetracked into computational creativity, which is uh, very much close to my home. So... I really appreciate your time. That was fantastic. So thank you for having let's me. Let's do this again next year. Yes, uh, and and see see what's changed. See what's changed, and then we'll have to data analyze the uh, evolution over the year and see whether machines have changed the way we think. Uh, so just to finish off, Hi. if you had to describe the next year in global digital hmm. in one word, what would it be? Growth. Let's see what there. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tom.